Is there good historical evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? How do we know this really happened? How do we think about a question that happened 2,000 years ago, and why is it important to talk about it today? Really excited to talk to my good friend, Dr. Jeremiah Johnston. He's got a great book on this, Body of Proof. We're gonna talk about that today, and the nine reasons to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so I'm excited to get into this. Jeremiah, glad you're joining us today. Jonathan, it's great to be with you. I'm a huge fan of you. I've been for years. I've appreciated your books, your ministry, and I'm delighted to see you on YouTube because your videos are so helpful. So uh, I'm just excited to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, awesome. Well, hey, it's we're leading up to Easter week, so there's no better time to talk about the biggest question in all of Christianity. Um, and so let's dive into that. And so before we dive in, I know you've got this great book, Body of Proof. You've got a study on this as well with Life way and resources, but I want to dive in. You've studied this. You did your doctoral dissertation on this. So what is the case against the resurrection? What would a skeptic say starting out? It's like, here are the reasons that we typically would say this didn't happen. Absolutely. So during my doctoral residency in Oxford, I was taught that when you present an argument, you definitely want to also present the counter argument and you do so without emotion. You do so as if you were believing that argument yourself. You want to do that argument justice and the counter argument justice. And so I spent a lot of time, Jonathan, I had three years in Oxford to look at all of the evidence against the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus and what indeed was the case against believing that Jesus' body was risen from the dead. And um, I wanted to capsule that in a helpful book. So actually, I begin with that in my book, Body of Proof, The Case Against the Resurrection of Jesus, because I want people to learn what I had to learn in Oxford over three years. Now, thankfully, uh, the case is really not that strong, so it doesn't require that that many pages, but it usually falls into very broad categories. And for the benefit of maybe skeptics who are watching this or seekers or new believers that might not be as well read, I would just say it falls under two broad categories. A would be deception theories of the resurrection, that these people were deceivers. And then um, the other would just simply be misconception theories. Um, we just kind of got it wrong. So those are the two broad categories for the case against the resurrection, misconception and deceit. Awesome. And so we're going to come back around to those to make sure we respond to those. We're also going to go through the powerful evidence that you lay out. But let's just start at the beginning. Why is this question important and central to Christianity? Connect the dots and uh, kind of help people understand why this is so important. Christianity is based on the historical fact that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb alive physically, bodily, from the grave after suffering extreme torment, both on a Roman cross and the flagellation, the beating that preceded the cross. We know that that date is April 5th, AD 33. We know it for a, a several a variety of factors. We can date the crucifixion to April 3rd, the resurrection to April 5th, AD 33. Jesus Christ ministry is based in history. It's based in time. And so when I talk about the faith that we claim, our common shared faith Christianity, I don't get in some kind of religious trance, Jonathan. I don't need to um, do Christian history. I think about our faith the same way I think about Civil War history or World War II history or any other historical event. That's very important. And Christianity's closest cousin is this beautiful science called archaeology. That's Christianity's closest cousin. I can't emphasize it enough that Christianity, unlike any other religion in the world, puts itself to a historical test. And so why is this important to answer your question? Christianity doesn't exist without the resurrection of Jesus. Christianity crumbles. In fact, it was C.S. Lewis who said, to, and he said this in his book, Miracles, to preach Christianity, make no mistake, is to preach the resurrection of Jesus. But I'm very concerned, Jonathan, because um, it is the central event of our faith, so much so that it became the center of proclamation, what we call the dominical tradition of the church. The proclamation that Jesus rose from the dead actually took center stage over the very teachings of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. That's how essential the belief of resurrection is. So we have the teaching of Jesus or the dominical tradition that is trumped, as it were, by the resurrection event itself. And Paul, Paul in a devastating passage, tells us what rises and what falls. 
In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul says, look, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, our sins are not forgiven. We're still in our sins. And he carries on in verse 19, and he says, people should actually feel sorry for us if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. We should be the most pitied of all people. But the very next passage literally is, but Jesus has been raised from the dead, and here's why. And so when I look, though, at modern Christianity, and this is why I'm so thankful that you're having me on the Jonathan Morrow YouTube channel, most Christians today cannot give very few reasons why they believe Jesus is alive from the dead. They believe it, they just don't know why. They don't know that there is actual evidence for it. And so I'm praying that this conversation that we're having will be helpful to those believers uh, in particular. Absolutely, right. You know, Paul had the opportunity to forever separate faith from history, but he put those two things together in 1 Corinthians 15, in that letter right around 53 AD, right around that time, where he goes, hey, look, if you do not have a risen bodily raised from the dead, Jesus, you do not have Christianity. Go find something else. So those are the stakes. That's why this is so high. We're going to talk about the nine reasons to believe that Jesus raised from the dead. But before we do that, I want to talk about your story because it relates to how this happened because everybody didn't just line up cheering on and agreeing with everything that you were writing there at Oxford, I'm assuming. No. But <laughs> tell us a little bit about how Nobody that went. At first. <laughs> yeah, so t- uh, unpack that a little bit and why that, how that connects to the topic we're going to talk about today. Well, I did not go a confessional track for my terminal education. I went to Oxford. I studied under Marcus Bachmuel at Keeble College. I went to faculty of theology there. My doctoral supervisor was Craig Evans. Paul Foster, uh, head of school at University of Edinburgh, my, was my UK supervisor. These are people that are very well known in biblical scholarship. And when it came time for me to do my viva, my viva voce is what you call it in, in England anyways, is to give with living voice a defense of your of your thesis. And in England, it's pass fail, Jonathan. So you can never repeat a PhD if you fail your viva. Um, they give you an M fill. So if you ever see someone with an MPhil from a UK-based educational program, it's likely they didn't complete their PhD, but at least they got some kind of uh, accolade coming out of it. And so I came to this point of defending my thesis December 11, 2012. I'd already finished a 93,000-word Überlieferungsgeschichte, which is in German, a history of interpretive tradition of the resurrection of Jesus within the Judeo-Christian motif. And so I traced resurrection traditions from the very beginning of Hebrew Bible through the intertestamental period into the New Testament, and then where it finds its fullest expression in second century Christianity. And I interpreted those passages and tried to give an original contribution to knowledge. There's my PhD, okay? Yeah. It's a not a little. Um, but I get to my point of defending the thesis, and they had selected a gentleman by the name of William Telford to be my doctoral um, examiner. And he took the train over from Durham. He studied and he came out of Cambridge. Uh, he was the student of the great William Barclay. Jonathan, John MacArthur quotes William Barclay in all of his commentaries. He died in 1979. A lot of American pastors that watch your show probably still quote William Barclay Bible backgrounds. Never mind, he died a Unitarian apostate Mm. who denied his faith, who didn't believe in the miraculous. In fact, I was just speaking at a pastor's conference, and I pointed out how William Barclay, in his commentary, with perfection, Jonathan, exegetes exegetes Romans chapter 5. I mean, I could not improve on his exegesis. You get to the end of Romans 5, he goes, now, none of this is true, but Mm. that's how you exegete the passage. So his student, wow. William Telford, is the scholar who is examining me in my PhD. So that context is important. And Mr. Telford, Professor Telford, he has a big bow tie on, and he said, Jeremiah, I just have one question. And Jonathan, half the words he was using were, were Latin. I didn't know if he was complimenting me or criticizing me. I just kind of went with it. And, uh, and he said, Jeremiah, I just have one question as we begin your viva. So keep in mind, it's pass fail, right? I mean, everything is riding on this moment for the rest of my life. He said, do you actually believe the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact? Or is that just imaginative storytelling? Now, I had never heard this euphemism, imaginative storytelling. And I said, Professor Telford, um, wise men choose probabilities. David Hume says that, said that. 
I believe with all my heart, the evidence leads me to believe that Jesus physically, bodily rose from the grave. And he paused, he leaned forward, and he said, I don't see it that way. Let's start <laughs> your Viva. And we started my Viva on that note. And the hilarious part was in Oxford, you know, they had told me for years, we don't care what you believe, Johnston. None of us care what you believe. When you go, you go to research induction school, they don't care what you believe. All they want is, can you prove your argument? Can you write a doctoral thesis? Can you sustain your argument? Is it compelling? Is it cogent? Is it original? They don't care if it's true. They don't care if you believe it or not. And yet the very first question I'm asked in my Viva is, do I believe this? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like game on. And so at that point, you're defending it. And a lot of that, and uh, if I recall, 93,000 words, give or take, Correct. you defended, Correct. you published that, and you've distilled that down into this excellent book, Body of Proof. So let's get into it. Some of those reasons, let's count it down from nine to one. And I should add, if you don't mind, he did later pass me with commendation. I always forget to add that. And then people at me later, well, finish your story. Did you pass or did you fail? <laughs> well, I actually passed. And he even recommended it for publication. Well, that's that's great. And that also gives credibility to the fact that, look, this is a serious topic of historical inquiry that even right. a skeptical scholar would recognize the merits of the case and the, and the rigor with which you went about it. So that's significant. So let's dive in. Let's count down nine to one. Give me okay. a reason. Let's start us off uh, with, the, with the first reason or the ninth reason. We'll go nine down to one on why it's reasonable to believe that Jesus raised from the dead. And I want to point out something. I can do more than nine reasons, but again, we how much can we take? Okay, so yeah. these are not the only nine reasons. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I've become convinced about a tenth reason that I'm now writing a book on itself, just that reason alone. But just to set the table, there are 300 passages in the New Testament that talk about the resurrection of Jesus. The promise we're given with more frequency than any other promise is the promise of John 14, 19. Jesus says, because I live, you will live also. Number one, the first line of evidence for the body of proof is the resurrection of Jesus, in my opinion, is, according to the scripture, the only way we ultimately make sense of the suffering in our lives. And the passage that I always point to is Romans chapter 8, verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not com worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us someday. When I look at suffering and theodicy, and I know you've discussed that on this channel, without the resurrection of Jesus, none of it makes sense. Yeah. The resurrection of Jesus is what gives us hope. Hope is a word that is a power word in the New Testament. It's used a hundred times or more in the Greek New Testament. And because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have unending hope. Romans says we have a hope that will not disappoint. Hebrews says we have a better hope, a longer hope. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 is a passage I've been memorizing, Jonathan. Blessed be the God and Father of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has invited us into a living hope. Living hope. Why? because of the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. I'm so happy that with the suffering that we endure, and some of your viewers now may even be suffering, we may not even know why, but the resurrection tells me that someday we'll know why, and someday it will all be worth it, because the resurrection of Jesus is the key to our hope. And so I actually don't begin with an academic reason, do I? I begin with a, a real true reason in life, that when you look at someone who was hostile to the gospel, who killed Christians, uh, his sufferings, and he was called the Job of the New Testament. So all you have to read is Second Corinthians 1 and Galatians 1 and 2, some of his autobiographical uh, Philippians 3, um, St. Paul knew what it was to suffer, and he that's why he would write, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. So that's point number one for me, for the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah, and that's so powerful. And again, people who are maybe, we'll get to the historical evidence, but what's beautiful about Christianity, as you will see as Dr. Johnson unpacks this case, is it brings together the personal and the evidential together beautifully in a way that, frankly, no other worldview can or does. And so I think that's powerful. I mean, I've lost people in my life. I'm sure you have. I'm sure people watching, things are not the way they're supposed to be. And if you want an answer that, that, that speaks to the biggest areas of life, the resurrection, if it happened, and we believe that it does, then that changes everything in terms of our hope to press through suffering and pain and loss. That's right. And I mean, when I think that Christianity, to your point, 
unlike all the other religions in the world, Christianity attempts an answer at the problem of evil. Only Christianity attempts to help us understand suffering and pain, and the world is not as it should be. And the resurrection of Jesus is what we live for. We don't live for the 80 or so years that we're given on this earth. We live for the resurrection. And this is why, for those who have lost someone, as I have, as you have, Jonathan, we can talk about our loved ones who died in the Lord in the present tense. That's the beauty of 2 Corinthians 5, 8. To be absent with the body from the body is to be present with the Lord. First Thess 4 says, we grieve, but we grieve in hope. And there's a huge difference between grieving without hope and grieving with hope. And as somebody who is, you know, a doctorate, you know, you get a PhD, you know a lot about a little. The little I know a lot about is the resurrection of Jesus. And, and I find it remarkable as someone who's done quantitative and qualitative research on the impact of resurrection belief over the course of the last 2000 years, individuals who should have no hope, individuals who should just be merry and die. Um, they find hope, enduring hope to face the most difficult challenges in life because they take these passages seriously about the resurrection of Jesus. And it gives them the confidence to endure and the hope to have another day. And I, I think that merits its own evidential proof. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It explains what, need to ex what needs to be explained. And so we're looking at the nine best reasons to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Number nine. What about number eight? Let's go to another reason. Okay, it's important that skeptics say that Jesus didn't really know what he was doing. After all, was his ministry even three years? Was it a year? Did Jesus even know he was God? You've done a great video on this. Did Jesus claim to be God? Was Jesus God? The skeptical camp will claim that um, this image that we have of Jesus as God was foisted on him later after the fact that he had no intention of being God. He didn't think of himself as God. Well, that flies in the face of the evidence. We see that Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. If the early church had a hashtag, it would be hashtag on the third day. When you study um, the resurrection accounts and the crucifixion accounts and then the pre passion prediction accounts embedded in the four gospels, you're going to see that Jesus was constantly repeating himself. And you're going to see that the disciples were constantly getting it wrong, misinterpreting it. So Jesus had to keep like a good teacher repeating himself. Like I have to repeat myself to my five kids. And then they ask dumb questions just like the disciples do or they try to stop the program of my family, just like Jesus' disciples tried to stop his messianic program. In Mark 8, 31, in Mark 9, 31, in Mark 10, 33, and 34, Jesus says the Son of Man, a, a designation he uses 69 times in the gospel, his favorite self-designation. All you have to do is read Daniel 7 to understand the importance of him referring to himself as the Son of Man. The San Son of Man must die. He will be killed. And he will rise, here it is, on the third day. Now, Jonathan, if you and I were Jewish boys growing up in the time of Jesus, when we would hear on the third day, we would have understood from the Aramaic Targums, which are developing in Jewish synagogue in this time, that on the third day comes right out of Hosea 6, 2, and 3. On the second day, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Jesus does something so cool. And I like this word. I like this word I'm about to use. Jesus likes to messianize Old mm -hmm. Testament passages, and he applies them to his life and ministry to give us greater interpretive precision to help understand his ministry after the fact. John 2, same thing. He'll destroy the temple and build it up in three days. The, for, the, the, the Kirigama, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, that Jesus died according to our sins, according, uh, accor he died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried in, quote, on the third day, according to the scripture, rose again. So Jesus called it. That's my point. That's number eight for us. Jesus called it. He I predicted it. I love it. I love it. And so you may want to get to this later on, but somebody might be going, well, look, I, it seems as though everything you just mentioned is in the Bible and you shouldn't be able to use the Bible to prove the Bible. Right. <laughs> so as a yeah. historian, talk about that in that way of thinking, because there's a lot of people that are just confused about the fact that it's like once you mention something that's included in the Bible, it automatically becomes not historical. Talk about why right. that's not the case well, and maybe how to think better about that. That's like driving a car and not using the manual that came with the car. If you drive, I drive a big Texas truck. 
I was given a manual by the manufacturer. And so if I want to know how to drive my Texas truck off road, I want to find a manual that's early and it's written by someone who was close to the factory or maybe worked in the factory in which it was produced. When I do history, I don't go into a religious trance. I'm looking for eyewitness testimony. I'm looking for the earliest documents of that event. I used to live in Franklin, Tennessee, where the bloodiest five hours of the Civil War took place, the Battle of Franklin. Five Confederate generals were killed at the Battle of Franklin in the span of a few hours. And guess what? We have letters that were written during the time. We have evidence artifactually. We have muskets. We have um, all kinds of material culture artifacts that help us get close to the very event. And see, unlike the hyper-skeptic, I'm willing to concede that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are actual historical documents. And again, this is very important. And someone might be commenting right now, well, I don't think they are. Well, why don't you come with me to Israel to archaeology digs in the land of Israel, and I'll introduce you to some Jewish agnostic archaeologists. These digs are very costly, Jonathan. They recruit college students. They happen in the summer and they happen in December because that's when college kids can volunteer and pay for their expenses to come and be part of the digs. By the way, 90% of these are by secular institutions. These agnostic archaeologists use six books to make sure they're digging in the right spot. Now, I, I hope your audience has heard, has heard of a few of these six books that archaeologists enjoy using to make sure that where they're digging exhibits verisimilitude with the, with the resources that they're utilizing. They use these books called Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Book of Acts, and Josephus. Those are the six books the atheist or agnostic Jewish archaeologist uses. And so if they use them as historical, reliable documents, why wouldn't I? If I'm truly committed to finding truth, I'm not, you know, my expertise, if you really want to geek out, is second century Christianity and what some call the apocryphal gospels. And I can tell you why people don't use those at archaeology digs and why people use Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Book of Acts, and Josephus. So that's my answer to that. Yeah, love that. And that's very, very important. So if you are open-minded and want to consider the facts, then you want the earliest and best and eyewitness sources, which are contained in the New Testament. They don't become less historical because they happen to be collected and put in what we now bind Correct. and sell and things like that. So just, just a few thoughts for people to consider as you investigate these claims about Jesus. So we've talked about two reasons so far, a key objection about history. What's our next reason? reason number, number seven, seven, counting down. I like yeah. this. Jesus demonstrated resurrection power. So if he has power over death, we see resuscitations that, ex that are experienced in and around the life of Jesus. I cannot emphasize this enough that Jesus' fame and popularity, first and foremost, is as an exorcist and a miracle worker. Jesus is able to exorcise demons over long distance. He doesn't charge for that. Uh, his disciples are in a quandary because other disciples are even invoking Jesus' name in his lifetime, and they're wondering if they should tell him to stop. And Jesus says, don't stop them. Uh, Jesus' name is recognized with power from artifacts that we have from the first century, second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century, that if you just insert this name of Jesus into a prayer or into a curse even, uh, it seems to have more power that way. Jesus demonstrated resurrection power in Mark 5, 21 to 43. He raises Jairus's daughter from the dead. In Luke 7, 11 through 17, I think it is, the widow of Nain's son is, again, risen from the dead. And of course, where I just filmed, and this is captured in my Body of Proof Bible study in Bethany, the very spot where Jesus said, do ro exo, Lazarus, come forth, we filmed. Many Christians have not been there. Jews really aren't allowed there. It's West Bank. Um, and Jesus, so Jesus demonstrated resurrection power. Now, the fascinating thing about this is these three whom Jesus raised from the dead would die a second time. And in fact, we have evidence of that. We know that Lazarus has a second burial spot. This is kind of ironic. The, I, I have a lecture I give those who die twice. Uh, Lazarus died a second time and he's buried on the island of Cyprus. And I don't, I don't think he was worried about it the second time around. Uh, he'd been through it once already. So Jesus demonstrated resurrection power is point number seven. Love that. And so be, that's kind of a way of authenticating. All right, let's move on to number six. What is the sixth best reason 
to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? This re represents, in my mind, an original contribution to resurrection dialogue and arguments. I published this in a, in a textbook, actually. Um, Jesus's bodily resurrection was not what his disciples or any other Jews, for that matter, anticipated. That's number six for us. Very, very important. And some Christians today would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jeremiah. What do you mean they didn't expect him to um, die by crucifixion or rise from the dead? I mean, they didn't. Um, Isaiah 53, the way we interpret it today, was not a widely held interpretation in, in late Second Temple Judaism. In fact, when I appeal to things like 4Q285, a Qumran scroll found in K4, number 285, it talks about the fact that Messiah, when he comes, will kill the Roman occupiers. He will even execute the Katim. Uh, the Roman emperor himself will die at the hands of the Messiah. He will uh, vanquish a corrupt priesthood like the ruling priests, and he will purify a defiled temple. That was what was in the, the interpretation of the Essene, the Qumran community. We even see this in Matthew 16 when Jesus says, or when Peter says to Jesus, you're not going to go to the cross. And he says, get behind me, Satan. So, uh, I, I draw this out in the black book, Body of Proof, that Jesus was not the only, the only Messiah on the first century scene to claim to be God's Messiah. In fact, there were 10 other Messianic pretenders or contenders, I might call them. Two of them are actually talked about in the book of Acts. So Jesus isn't the only guy in the first century parading around saying, hey, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God. Um, and several of those other messiahs had much larger followings, I might add. One had a following of 4,000, and they would even follow him out into the wilderness in Egypt. It was a stronger following. This is why you have Gamaliel in, in the book of Acts say, hey, if this movement is of God, it, it, will, it will, nothing can stop it. But if it's of man, it'll just come to naught. So again, no one was anticipating it. And so this is kind of part A of of a bonus feature I want to share later. So I'm going to stop right there. Yeah. Just keep that in your mind that no one anticipated the Messiah to die and they certainly didn't anticipate a resurrection. Yeah. And that's key because events happen in a context and you right. can't interpret the event of the resurrection without the context in which Jesus is stepping into what he's talking about, what he's saying, things like that. So really, really important. All right. What's our next reason? The sources written in archaeological overwhelmingly confirm the resurrection accounts embedded in the Gospels. So when you look at uh, the science of archaeology, when you look at the material culture, when you look at Jewish burial traditions, and then we, we compare that to what we actually read in the Gospel narratives, it all smacks of authenticity. And in my book, I quote atheist archaeologist Jody Magnus, University of North Carolina, and others who when they read the, uh, the execution, what you might call the juridical procedure of the Gospels, guess what Jody says, the Gospels get it right. And this is why I wanted to film at all of the resurrection sites of Jesus in Jerusalem. Point number, I forget what number we're on, but this point about the archaeological I think it's five. discoveries, I think we're five. Yeah. Um, counting down from nine, this is number five. Yeah. Um, I wanted to film and take you by the hand. So if you grab the Body of Proof Bible study book, in the back there's a code, and you can go with me. And we go to, a, we film 11 different episodes. Some are as short as uh, 90 seconds, others are 13 minutes long, where we look at these very spots where these resurrection miracles occurred. And again, it all smacks of authenticity of what we know from Jewish burial traditions and the material culture of archaeology. Yeah, so it fits the context, the time, the issue, like the artifacts, those kind of things like that. That's great. So I think we're up to number four, if I'm counting correctly. So what is the fourth are. best reason? To and again, we're giving the... some, bo some bonuses. This one is probably my favorite because, again, we, we have to ask ourselves the critical questions. It is the only convincing explanation for the conversion of those who did not follow Jesus during his lifetime. And specifically, I want to point out that a court, we have appearance tradition and the historical record, and we have what's called empty tomb tradition. And how do you explain, uh, so Jesus, therefore, appeared to those who believed in him, 
He, he appeared to those who were indifferent to him, and he also appeared to those who were completely hostile to him. And we see this recorded in the earliest sources. Jesus's brother, James, did not believe he was the Messiah. In fact, John 7, verse 5 says, not even his brothers believed on him. Mark 3, 21, his family thought he was out of his mind. Yeah. And yet in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, and he appeared to James. Peter and John and then James become the pillars of the first century church. So you have a guy who is a complete skeptic, who knew Jesus longer and better than anyone, who was not convinced of his Messiahhood until he rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. Then he becomes the leader of the church at Jerusalem. Josephus, not a Bible, not a Bible book, Josephus tells us that in AD 62, James is stoned to death, believing his brother is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, I mean, Jonathan, I can't emphasize this enough because I have four sons and none of them think another one of them is the Messiah or the Son of God. They certainly wouldn't die and stake their life on that claim. And yet James does that very thing. And so for me, when you look at the hostile conversions to Christianity, Paul, who was murdering Christians, has an experience of Jesus on the road to Damascus that utterly transforms his worldview, so much so he's able to write something like Galatians 3.28, that we're all one in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Only the resurrection can do that. Yeah, so that's, I mean, just those those appearances and the transformational elements of that, and how do you explain that, right? Remember, a, a good explanation, this is profound, explains what needs to be explained. Right. right. People love to, to drop like Occam's razor. It's like, well, the simplest explanation yeah. is the best one. It is if it explains what needs to be explained. Right. But if it doesn't right. explain what needs to be explained, then you have to expand the uh, the pattern to make sure you actually explain the evidence that you've got. To see, so right. We are now down to number three. What is the third best reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? This is big because, again, if, if the resurrection's true, it should have an effect on the way people live their lives. It shouldn't just be an academic exercise. And so the resurrection of Jesus, for me, is the only convincing explanation for the historical fact that everywhere the Christian movement goes in the, and is embraced, society is dramatically improved. What do I mean by that? Um, equal rights, the rights of women and children civic liberties. Rufus Fears, the now dead professor of history at University of Oklahoma, said the idea of individual freedom comes from one source and one so source alone, Christianity. The resurrection gives us the worldview of individual freedom. Um, the, the truth that Jesus Christ is alive from the dead caused individuals to care for people's bodies from the womb to the tomb. Body dumping was a big deal in Rome in the first century. Um, people would, you know, if you and I had a slave, Jonathan, and we just kick him to the curb, literally, when he was dead, not even bury him. Christians come along and their belief in the resurrection is such that they have to innovate a new term for barrier, ba burial. No longer is it called a sarcophagus, which in Greek, Greek literally means a flesh-eating box. That wasn't good enough to describe how Christians should be buried. So they come up with this new term called koimaterion in Greek. It's the word we get cemetery from. Yes, every time you drive by a cemetery, understand that that is an innovation of Christianity. It means dormitories, sleeping rooms. So robust was the collective belief that death is temporary. It's like sleeping. They're willing to even call their grave sites cemeteries which then become the first Christian art galleries expressing their hope in the resurrection, anchor crosses, ichthus, um, signs of the fish, Jesus, etc. the hope of the resurrection. And this hope is profound. I didn't even mean to, but in my Bible study book, I use the word hope 143 times because mm. the, all roads for the resurrection always lead back to hope for us. Yeah, no, I love that. And, I, and those innovations don't happen by accident, right? There's innovations that happen because there's a cause. There's a cause and effect relationship. And this pattern fits together. I love how you're putting these things together. All right. I think we're up to number two. What is the second? All right, best these are the bonuses. The if, bonus. if Jonathan and Jeremiah were inventing the resurrection of Jesus, and if Jonathan and Jeremiah wanted to invent a trendy new religion in the first century, we never would have invented Christianity. In other words, if the disciples 
and invented the resurrection narratives, they did a terrible job because every aspect of Christianity is offensive to someone in the first century. We certainly know that women were at a great disadvantage in the first century. We understand their, their, their voice was not um, given credit in a court of law, that many of them were uneducated. They couldn't be educated along with men, and yet Christianity's most vocal proponents are women. Some of the financiers of early Christianity who pay for the gospel to go forward are women like Phoebe. And the other women mentioned in Luke 8 and Luke 24, Christianity's greatest um, competitor was the cult of Mithra in the first century, was a male-only dominated cult uh, popular in the Roman legions, whereas Christianity embraces men and women, and men and women worship together. And so there are other very offensive details, none more offensive than the idea that a, a dead, rotting, ripe corpse would come back to life. Nobody believed in resurrection outside of Jews. Jews believed in a general resurrection someday, but the idea of a corporeal resurrected body was something that was so outlandish, no one had even ever thought of that before. And yet, why did they begin their proclamation with that very thing is because that's what actually happened. And so I get into this, uh, Christianity leaves itself open to objectors like um, Porphyry, um, and others who who ridicule the Christian movement for being this lowbrow. What you know, it was women who were your first um, witness witnesses, and you have these slaves and others worshiping together. It's ridiculed for all the reasons that make it valid today from a historical perspective. And so, if you and I wanted to make it up, we wouldn't have made it up the way Christianity did if we wanted it to have to gain traction. Yeah, absolutely. Because, and again, if we put on our historian hat and not just kind of the Bible tells me so hat, right? And we believe the Bible, believe the Bible is the word of God, teach on that. It's the inspired and word of God. That's a separate argument, separate case that we could make for that. But the idea is, okay, what explains these factors all converging at the same time? And it would have to take over those other beliefs at the time, right? And so you had that Jewish right. belief of resurrection at the end of time. And then the Greco-Roman beliefs, kind of this immortality of the soul, they don't even want a bodily resurrection. Right. They want to be set free from the body. You know, so there's right. no momentum in that direction. And you document that so well in your book, Body of Proof, because that's also got to be explained if we're going to talk about that. Now, before we get to the number one uh, best reason, I want to make sure if you're liking this video, make sure you like, subscribe, share this with friends who want to have a deeper faith and understanding of their worldview and things like that. But without further ado, let's get to the number one best reason for the resurrection of Jesus. So this is part B of what I shared earlier. There's no psychological motivation to invent a resurrection narrative. Ju Judaism is a is a is a is a religion that is cohesive. Um, it didn't need it. We could have said Jesus was a great rabbi. We would not have had to make up the fact that he rose from the dead. It, it isn't needed. Um, we could have we could have uh, we could have revered Jesus in our writings. We could have said great things about him as other rabbinic sources talk about other great rabbis, both before, during, and after the time of Jesus. There's simply no psychological motivation for us to invent a resurrection narrative. Judaism didn't need it because the first Christians were all Jews. And I filmed literally at Resurrection Ground Zero for Matthew 27, 52, that interesting passage where others were resurrected along with Jesus that first Easter weekend. And so because Jew Judaism is a coherent religion, it's a it didn't need it. Um, there would be no psychological motivation to invent it. And I cannot emphasize that enough. And that's where I land on. There are other reasons, but um, I wrote 9,000 words, by the way, on what I'm sharing with you right now on the fact that Judaism just simply didn't need it. And if it didn't really happen that way, there's no psychological motivation to say that it did. Yeah. And that's powerful, right? Because it would, there was no momentum to invent this. There was no momentum internally, externally, in society and you document this so well and you can't just say well they just would have invented it because they wanted to you know invent a new religion and get paid and sell all these books and no that's just not how that worked right no because history and truth actually matter right and so that's the number one number one best reason to think about that all that explanatory scope comes together now one of the objections and i want to talk about some of these key objections that people may have yeah 
please. What about the burial of Jesus? Like, cause, and, and, and you make an important distinction between, did Jesus have an honorable burial? Was he cast in a kind of open grave? Was it a proper burial? Like, what's the right terminology and why and how to think about that? Because some people say, look, we don't even know where he would have been buried. So how do we even know any of this stuff? So this is where it's so important. Thank you for asking a great question. Jewish burial traditions, going to the land of Israel with you, Jonathan, studying Jewish burial traditions is essential to appreciate the validity and the reliability of what we see playing out in the entire burial of Jesus. In the Mishnaic tradition, it was very important that if the Sanhedrin condemned a Jewish criminal to die, it was the Sanhedrin's responsibility to bury the Jewish criminal. In all of the crucifixions that we have that are not in wartime in the history of Jerusalem, no criminal is left on the cross at nighttime because the Jewish tradition said you had to be buried before nightfall. So anytime you encounter someone who's dead, whether they're crucified or whether they died by natural causes or murdered, they would always be buried on the day of their death, whether you're crucified or not. What do we see playing out in the gospel narratives? They're going to break Jesus's legs, why they were hoping to hasten death. They're shocked he's already dead by the time they do that. They don't need to break his legs. We have that gruesome detail in John's gospel that when his side is pierced, blood and water come out, showing us that Jesus had already been dead for a few hours by that point. Who is it that asks for the body of Jesus? None other than two members of the Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Normally, Jesus would have been buried in a proper burial site, not a place of honor, a proper burial site. And some of these were actually uh, designated by the Sanhedrin, but something unique happens. Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, a very wealthy man, a member of the Sanhedrin, offers his own family tomb as a spot for Jesus to be buried properly. So Jesus is buried properly. He's not buried honorably. But even if you were a crucified criminal, a year after your death, your bones could be collected. And this is a this is a procedure called oscillagium in Greek or second burial. And that's where, Jonathan, for those that go to the land of Israel, you see all the bone boxes all over the Mount of Olives, 150,000 of them and many more. We have ossuaries everywhere, bone boxes everywhere. This is that on the one year anniversary of death, the body or excuse me, the bones of the deceased person would be collected and placed inside the bone box. And we have that. We actually have a crucified criminal's remains, Yehuhanan, crucified uh, under the reign of Pontius Pilate in the late 20s. He's crucified. He's, his bones are collected a year later from his place of proper, not honorable burial. And so much so, uh, it's interesting, there's actually a crucifixion nail still wedged in his heel bone. And we actually have that artifact today. You can see it in the Israel Antiquities Museum. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would say, everything you see, um, again, smacks of authenticity. So when you study Jewish burial traditions, I do not concur with Bart Ehrman or with John Dominic Crossum, who claim that Jesus' body was left on the cross, eaten by dogs, or buried in some mass pit and people lost track of it. You didn't lose track of your loved ones. Burial was a sacred honor in Judaism, even if your family member died as a criminal. Yeah, and that's such helpful context. It was a public display with eyewitnesses and they would have they would have known where and then thank you so much for giving the context of the practices now obviously you've led students to israel i have as well we've been to these places um there's the church of the holy sepulcher there's the garden tomb uh where do you think is jesus burial and why in terms of archaeologically and the evidence there no, it's, it's a fascinating question. If you don't mind holding up the black book, Body of Proof, I actually have a bonus little 2,000-word chapter in the back of Body of Proof where I call, talk about the most significant place in all of Christianity. And I lay out the argument for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and I lay out the argument for the Garden Tomb. Now, the fascinating thing is I take all of my tours to both places. Yep. A lot of Protestant tours, though, never get to the Holy Sepulchre Church because— and I agree with them. Everything seems wrong about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, where I don't agree is not going. 
um, everything, even though everything seems wrong about the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, everything is right about it from an archaeological and evidential standpoint. It's fascinating. Um, in fact, I had the opportunity to film there. And outside of National Geographic, who did a documentary in 2017, I have yet to find anyone who has the footage that we have now inside the very edicule of the resurrection tomb of Jesus within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre complex. So I've stood there. I filmed there. Archaeologists who are not Christians believe that it's a first century tomb. It's actually a necropolis. It's a first century cemetery 50 feet from the tomb of Jesus or other first century tombs. I want to remind people what Jewish tombs look like. They look like your hand. Uh, the tomb is sealed at the bottom of your hand. You then go in the tomb. You, there's a place of mourning. Usually you would have to stoop down to get in, but you could stand once you got inside essentially the vestibule of the tomb. The fingers represent the burial niches where the bodies would be slid. You might have a few bodies in there. Why you would spice the body. The body would stink. You would care for the body for seven days. Again, this is Jewish burial traditions. And so everything we read in the gospel spat, smacks of that similarity. And so the issues that I have with the garden tomb, as much as I love it, and the garden tomb is helpful because it approximates what Jesus's tomb would have looked like in the first century. Evidentially, it's just too old, Jonathan. It's likely at minimum 250 years older than the crucifixion of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in many ways, the garden is that reflective place that your heart says, this is the place. And when you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you're like, this doesn't feel like the place, but rationally, this is the place. And so, right. you know, you, it, so it's a great document of that. You've got great footage of that as well. But, but the key point that I want to underscore is these places were known. They exist. They fit the evidence. They talk, they're, they, they, they're consistent with what we see in the earliest biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, described in the book of Acts, all that kind of stuff. So talk about, sometimes people are like, well, all these things are too late. Like the gospels are too mm. late. Um, are they too late to be historical in your view? I mean, this is just kind of another objection that comes yeah. up. When would you date the gospels, those earlier books of Jesus and <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff, just to throw, throw a couple of things out there that people often ask about yeah, this? No, these are excellent questions. Um, again, how we do history is so important. Paul is in Greek literally does historeo in Galatians chapter one. He wants to make sure he has the gospel right. So even though he experiences the resurrection of Christ himself, he still wants to make sure he has the gospel right. So he goes and he does history. He does historeo uh, in, for two weeks. I hope we can time travel someday because he meets with Peter, James, and John, the pillars of the church That's in awesome. Jerusalem for two weeks. What a trip that must have been where he just said, hey, I saw the resurrected Christ, but I do want to still make sure I'm getting the gospel right. And he said they added nothing to me just said let's keep caring for the poor i love that um when we look at the gospels we see that they're extremely early sources for jesus but they're not the earliest sources of the new testament the letters of paul actually antedate or predate the gospels um probably thessalonians is first um, we know that paul is the earliest source um, jonathan you and i very soon we'll actually see the Erastus stone and we'll be able to show how Corinthians is dated. We can date Corinthians to the Isthmian games of 8050. It's fascinating how you can have these, you have relative history mar mile markers and actual like this has happened here and then and we have those bifurcations really helpfully in the New Testament. And so the Gospels, I date the book of Acts before AD 62 because it doesn't mention uh, the death of James, which would have certainly been noteworthy for the readers of the book of Acts. Um, but again, I'm very comfortable. I mean, again, as a historian, one of the most reliable, <laughs> one, one of the most reliable documents for world World War II was published in the 90s by an eyewitness. Think about that. Uh, World War II, 50 years after World War II. So again, something very similar is playing out with the Gospels, if not even better. And nobody questions that, uh, that World War II historian publishing in the 90s, the memoirs of an eyewitness before he dies. The similar is true with Alexander the Great. Arian and Plutarch are the two greatest sources for Alexander the Great. Nobody questions anything about Alexander the Great, and yet both of those sources are written 400 years after his life. 
Uh, we have something far more reliable when you look at the the sources for Christianity with Paul's epistles, also the Catholic epistles. That would be the anti-legomena, the books spoken against. Um, uh, you have the book of James and those other writings. And then, of course, the Gospels themselves. No, that's really, really helpful. And so, um, you know, there's so many interesting things. Two objections. One, um, one is often it's like, why is the hallucination theory not a good reason to reject? So, well, well maybe the yeah. disciples just hallucinated. And that's the explanation. Yeah. Why is that not a good argument? Well, Garrett Ludemann uh, made that document, or excuse me, that argument famous. So this is returning to where we began. We can close where we began the case against the resurrection. He is the one who made this hallucination theory famous, that he believed um, more than 500 people all hallucinated the very same thing. The issue with that is there's just no scientific evidence of anyone hallucinating the same thing over the, over the similar amount of time with the exact same details. So again, some of these arguments are trendy. They sound mm -hmm. cool. Uh, they might be on trend in the moment, but uh, it's fascinating to me the lengths that Geert Ludemann would come up with. He's not denying that Jesus was d killed by Roman crucifixion. He's not denying the empty tomb. He doesn't believe it. And so he comes up with an alternative explanation that has no basis in history or evidence. Yeah. And so that's so crucial because, look, people go, the empty, t the evidence for the empty tomb is still there. The testimony of Paul, the evidence for that is still there. Just, you can't have a group dream anymore and then have a group hallucination. Like all of that stuff is so important because people, and this is important to think critically and people are watching this. It's really, really important. Um, well, Jesus had a twin brother and maybe he just had a twin brother on the cross. And that's what, had, that's explained. No, like, why is that a good reason? Why is that good? Just uttering words that come out of your mouth is not a good right. argument. And so that's just important. Um, other, and you're an expert on this, on the apocryphal gospels or the non, you know, canonical gospels, gospel of Peter is a different kind of explanation of what happens in the uh, explanation of what happens to Jesus in the empty tomb and all of that. Talk about that, because that's not part of scripture, not part of the Bible, but some people are like, the hey, well, it's the gospel of Peter. There's these lost gospels. Don't they shed light evidentially on this question? Yeah, they don't tell us anything about the historical Jesus. They don't tell us anything about the historical Peter or Thomas, but they do shed a lot of light uh, on the time, which, time in which they were written. Uh, in the case of the Gospel of Peter, which I date using paleography to the late second century, it seems to be answering as an apologetic for Christianity all those criticisms that are coming out of Celsus and Porphyry and other objectors of second century Christianity. In the Gospel of Peter, Jesus is huge. You have polymorphic Christology. He comes out of the tomb and it's, he's like a character from the Avengers. He's like the Hulk. He's gigantic. He has two, he has two angels with them. And the cross follows Jesus. For some reason, the cross is buried with Jesus. The patibulum is buried with the body of Jesus. And the cross even hovers out of the tomb uh, again, this is late second century apologetic, yeah. and the cross even speaks. The cross talks. Um, you have Jesus appearing to Pontius Pilate. You have the very name of the centurion is mentioned who claims that Jesus is the Son of God. So you have Jesus appearing not to women. Uh, because women were held in disdain as witnesses for anything. You have Jesus appearing to Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate declaring Jesus God. Um, there's a lot of anti-Semitism as well in the late second century Gospel of Peter because this is written right after the Bar Kokhba revolt of AD 132 to 135. And so it really shifts the blame from Romans to the death of Jesus completely at the hands of the Jews. And so again, it tells us a lot about battles that some Christian communities were facing in the late second century, but they don't tell us anything about the historical Jesus. Um, you have Jews literally camping out in a cemetery overnight. That would never happen in real life, never. Um, and so the, there's probably 60 or so gospel-like writings, Jonathan, that begin that continue to be produced for about mm -hmm. three to 400 years after what we call the canonical gospels. None of them tell, shed any light historically on the historical Jesus. They're interesting sources. They're interesting to study battles faced in the second, third, or fourth century, but they certainly, when you, all, all I, t and I encourage my students to read them, by the way, anytime someone brings them up to me, I'm like, well, have you read them? Yeah. <laughs> if you read them, and then if you read the Gospels, you might find the answer yourself.
Yeah, absolutely. And then that's so helpful. I just wanted to put that in there because sometimes people lump Very all helpful. of those things in together. Well, aren't all, all gospels the same? No, they're not. <laughs> the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, you know, that, that package plus Josephus' historical core, archaeologists use that, that's what you mentioned. And then all these later gospels, which are anachronistic, they read things back in. They don't tell the right story. The resurrection accounts in the in the historical gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are almost it's almost like and they're very matter of fact about it. And they saw yes. Jesus. And I'm going to the grocery store. And I'm going to cook some right. fish. And it's just it's no almost big talking crosses. Over, uh, reserved narrative in the gospels. Yeah. Almost so like they're holding back. Mm -hmm. So that so I think tons of good evidence to read, uh, believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. So again, if you're appreciating this conversation, definitely hit the like and subscribe button. But here's the thing: we're heading into Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Talk about the hope. I know you mentioned earlier that people don't talk about the resurrection enough. It only happens kind of in this maybe on Resurrection Sunday, but also or funerals, and those are vital times. But talk about the power of the resurrection for the everyday. Christian life and our purpose. Well, Jonathan, we're all on the road to Emmaus. The road to Emmaus on that first Sunday morning, April 5th, AD 33, was probably not very busy. We know that Cleopas and his wife Mary, we know his, her name is Mary from John's Gospel, uh, they're traveling the seven mile journey. They come to likely the Roman milestone where I filmed at for my Bible study. Very few have been there, very few know it exists. But you come to the milestones, these were like a rest stop between Jerusalem and Emmaus. And they begin to talk to a stranger. They don't recognize Jesus. They certainly don't recognize him as the resurrected Son of God. And they're so overwhelmed. Uh, they're so, they lack so much hope. Luke 24, 21 says they had hoped he was the Messiah, but they had given up hope. And often when we give up hope, we don't realize that as we're walking the road to Emmaus in life, Jesus is walking with us. And this stranger continues to uh, have a conversation with them. In fact, this stranger had plans to carry on and they prevail on him. And they say, no, at least come and have a meal at our house. I love Luke because there's always meal scenes in the gospel mm. of Luke. This is the yes. 13th meal scene in the 24th chapter of Luke's gospel. And it wasn't until they broke the bread and Jesus gave thanks to, for the bread that their eyes were opened and they realized that they had been walking with the resurrected Messiah this first Sunday morning the entire time. And Luke 24, 32 is a powerful passage because they, they actually made this claim, Jonathan, and this answers your question. They said, were not our hearts burning within us as he, the resurrected Messiah, open the scriptures to us and testified of himself. And that's my prayer that this conversation we've been enjoying today is not academic. Certainly it's, it's completely evidential. Certainly it's absolutely a thinking critical conversation, but the whole point of it is that your heart would burn with the truth of the resurrection and mine would as well. They didn't, they weren't able to recognize Jesus. And a lot of people watching now, they may be overcome with difficulties and problems and you don't realize you're on the road to Emmaus and Jesus is walking with you and Jesus calmly takes them in verse 27 of Luke 24 he begins with Moses and then he goes to the prophets and the writings so in the Jewish culture that would have been Genesis to the end of Chronicles and he shows how all of it not just some of the verses all of the verses all of the Old Testament testified of his messiahhood and that's where we need to be today. We need to all get back on the road to Emmaus and know that Jesus is with us. And then they had this shot of hope that must have been the greatest adrenaline rush of all time, because at that very moment, they run seven miles back to Jerusalem. So they did 14 miles in one day. So enthused, so filled with hope that it was actually true that Jesus had conquered death and they would too through him. Love it. He is risen and that changes everything. Jeremiah, thanks so much for the conversation. Where can people find more about your work, the important writings and, and all the stuff that you're doing right now? Well, thank you. Um, first off, I'd love to connect with people. Just go to christianthinkers.com and my socials are there. You can reach me via email there. I would just absolutely love to connect with everyone watching and stay in touch with you for videos like this as well. And just Jonathan, so grateful for your leadership. You exemplify what it is to be a Christian thinker. So thank you for all you're continuing to do. It's a privilege to be on your broadcast and look forward to hopefully do it again. Absolutely. Love it and look forward to talking more about this soon. Again, like, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video.